are here again is the overview of the class and where we are. We've looked, uh, obviously, at the introduction on Monday. We worked our way through those basic foundational issues. We spent several days in exegesis studying the biblical text, and yesterday we began to look at this, this next category, exposition, taking all of the data that we've accumulated in our study and crafting out of that an expository sermon. Exposition, then, is uh, where we find ourselves, crafting an expository sermon. Here is the process, just to remind you, writing the proposition. That's where we started yesterday, working through that really most essential thing. As, as Broadus says, a, a sermon may have one point or ten points, but ultimately it has to have one point because it's about something. That paragraph is about something, and therefore you take your exegetical theme and you make a proposition. We talked about the sort of components, the part of that package that is the proposition. Then structuring the message, the the bones, the skeleton, the outline, and how how to do that, how the you simply take what you did in the syntactical analysis and it becomes your outline as you take out the the dated elements, the proper nouns, all of those things that sort of tie it back to the the past and you make it timeless. We are in the middle of building the body of the sermon, looking at what, how do you include all of the elements necessary once you have the proposition, once you have the, the skeleton, the outline, how do you sort of inform all of those points with the necessary information. We'll come back to that. After we finish that today, we'll go to creating a logical flow, how to tie those those points, your main points together in a way that allows people to track with you and know that you're leaving one point and moving to another so they're not lost along the journey with you. Then writing an introduction and conclusion, formatting your notes, what what you're going to take into the pulpit with you, and then preparing your heart to preach. Those are the elements we still have left. We're going to finish the body of the sermon, and then we're going to deal with those four elements, and then we'll spend a few minutes on delivery, and then if we have time left, we'll cover some practical issues just of, uh, of ordering your week to try to fit all this in. Okay? So that's where we're going. Uh, most of these are not going to take as much time as the first three did, because that's really the, the core of your sermon. All right, so let's, let's move on then. In building the body of the message, there are four components. Explanation, this is, this is what it says and what it means. Argumentation, this is why you should believe it. Illustration, this is what it looks like. Application, this is what you should do with it. Those are the components of the body of the sermon. Now, we are looking at application. This is what you should do with it. Here's how you should respond. And we went through yesterday, we finished up with just some basic principles. The chief principle of application, the guiding principle is what? The same principle that sort of guided us through this whole process. Authorial intent. Authorial intent. You're always looking, even in application, your chief application of your sermon should be as close as you can get to what the original author wanted his original readers to do with it. Again, you may have to vary that some. I gave the illustration of your teaching through the pastoral epistles in your church to a group of people who aren't pastors, who aren't elders. Okay, what do you do with that application? Well, the very first thing you do is you make the application Paul was making in the pastoral epistles. You say, I and the other elders, we are responsible to do this in this way because that was the primary intent application of the passage intended by the author. Then you can take it legitimately to the next step and say, but it applies to all of us in this way. Does that make sense? So, authorial intent. And I gave you several others. It needs to be suited to the audience. That's an illustration as well, uh, what I just gave. So, there there were seven different principles. We ended with this one. Let me just remind you, because it was the very end of class, and you may have been packing up, if not your stuff, certainly your mind. Um, Where does application go in the sermon? Throughout really is better, okay? You can make it 
certainly at the end, and often I'll bring application to bear at the end, I will often bring, and I don't always say it the same way, but I'm often going to bring application at the end that deals with believers and that deals with unbelievers. That doesn't mean I take five minutes of every sermon to share the gospel. I don't believe that that is necessary. The Holy Spirit is, is more than capable of using the basic truths of the gospel spread throughout my sermon in order to bring someone to faith. Uh, in fact, I came to faith listening to a message about heaven that had no presentation of the gospel in it whatsoever because I saw I wasn't going to be there. When he was going through that list of, those list of people uh, and, and people with certain behaviors who wouldn't be in heaven, it's like, wow, that I'm in there like twice, maybe three times. I'm not going to be in heaven. And so there was, a, uh, there was the Holy Spirit's work through that. So I don't think, I, I had someone come to my church who'd come from a church, unfortunately even of a, of a master's grad, who had inculcated into them that it really wasn't a Christian sermon. It wasn't a gospel sermon. It wasn't a, a Christ-centered sermon unless every preacher took five minutes at least of every sermon to just go through the basic gospel message again. I don't believe that's true. But I do believe our, our preaching ought to be filled with the truths of the gospel so that there is sufficient, in, in, Lord willing, in every message, there is at least in the flow of that message enough truth about man's sin, about God as the Redeemer in Christ, about the death of Christ, that that person, the Holy Spirit has enough information to bring them to faith. That's my goal. But saying it the same way, tying it together in a package somewhere in the sermon, you know, I, that's not something I feel compelled to do. All right, so throughout the body of the sermon, in the conclusion, and uh, both, I, I, I prefer that method. Now, let's go to the definition, or, or let me first of all give you this quote again. A sermon is not like a Chinese firecracker to be fired off for the noise it makes. It is a hunter's gun, and at every discharge, he should look to see his game fall. I really, I love that quote. And that's really what we're talking about in application. Now, John Broadus in his book gives us a sort of definition of application. And, and I think in three categories, he summarizes what application is. First of all, he says it's focusing the claims of truth on our lives. In other words, it's answering the question, so what? It's the clear, either direct application in the text or the clear implications of the text. This is application proper, in which you answer for the, for the listeners somewhere in that sermon, so what? What do you do with this? Some of the targets of application in this sense are our people's expectations, their affections, their decisions, their attitudes, their knowledge, their behavior, their relationships, their motives, their values, their priorities, their character. Okay? All of those things are legitimate for focusing the claim of, claims of truth. A given passage may be all about correcting their knowledge. It may be all about correcting some behavior. It may be about correcting their attitude, or it might have all of that woven together. But you're focusing that passage on them and answering the question, so what? The second sort of part of the definition of application is suggesting ways and means to implement the truth of that passage. This answers the question, how? Now, sometimes the text itself gives this. Other times, you will teach the truth, you'll give the so what, and then you'll say, now, let me just give you some practical suggestions as to, as to ways you might consider doing this, okay? That's this element. Practical suggestions concerning the best mode and means of performing the duty that the Scripture is urging upon us. It answers the questions, now what or how? Now, let me just give you a warning here. Unless the text itself is giving these means, these how-tos, and sometimes that is true, unless the text is giving it, then be very careful 
that you don't speak with the same authority when you're suggesting how biblical truth might be implemented or applied into the life. Our, our authority, men, stops with the word of God. I have no right to bind a person's conscience with something that isn't here, chapter and verse. And so it's, it may be helpful to give some practical ideas. Let me give you, well, I'll, I'll hold off because I'm going to give you some examples. But, but there's, a, there's a reason why for me, this kind of application often comes in my conclusion, separated from the explanation of the text. And I will say something like this. If I'm going to do this and it's not inspired, I'll actually say that. You know, I'll give, the, I'll give the inspired application, the original application the author intended, without apology and with full authority. And then I'll say, now let me give you a couple of ideas for ways you might implement this. Let me just tell you, this is not inspired. You know, this is not the authority of Scripture, but here are some things for you to consider. I'll say that. So I'm always differentiating between what the Scripture commands and where it speaks authoritatively and where I'm offering some suggestions for maybe how they could implement this in their lives. And, and I think that keeps your credibility as a preacher because it, it lets them see when you are speaking with authority, you're speaking from the Word of God, and when you're not, you're speaking from yourself, which is exactly how it should be. So, uh, unfortunately, that's not always true. I've, I've heard preachers who don't make that distinction, and they're making their application, and they make a legitimate biblical application, one that flows from authorial intent, and then they make the suggestion of ways and means, and there's no differentiation. I, I heard a man that's, that's well known. He, he, he's part of the, or at least has been part of the Together for the Gospel, do this very thing here at Shepherd's Conference. You have to differentiate between the, the authority of Scripture and its um, direct application, the one the author intended, and that's clear in the text versus your own ideas about maybe how this can be implemented may be helpful. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and I think the importance is balance. You know, Jay Adams talks about in preaching you need to, you know, you need to use you and not we. You, you, you. And I agree with that up to a point. But I think at the same time, you have to remember your connection with the people of God. I remind my people often. When I'm teaching you the Bible, I'm sitting under the Word of God just as you are. I'm just a mouthpiece for the Lord. I'm using the gift He gave me. But just as you're sitting there under the Word of God as I'm teaching, even as I'm teaching, I'm sitting under the Word of God. We all are under its authority. And so I, I think there's a balance, um, particularly if, um, if it is a universal sort of struggle. If we're talking about controlling our mouths, if we're talking about temptations to pride, if we're talking about temptations to lust, if we're talking about temptations, all of those sort of universally felt that every person at some point in life experiences these, why would I say you and not we? If on the other hand, I'm talking about homosexuality, which is not a temptation that I understand or experience, then I don't need to say we. So I, I just think being honest with that and and not highlighting it, not making a big point of it, just making a choice there. Um, you, you at sometimes you want to associate yourself with people. You know, I love that Hebrews 5 discussion about the, the high priest. You know, he, he is appointed from among men. Why? Because he's, he's able to understand them. You know, he's able to understand them because he shares their, their weaknesses. And I think there's a point of our doing that as well. But at the same time, obviously, if I'm at the end of my message, I'm bringing the gospel to bear in Romans. I will say, we all need the gospel because that's universally true. And then I'll say, if you haven't come to the place yet where you've understood that, now I'm talking to them because I have, by God's grace, come to understand that. So I just think just sort of being sensitive to that, being honest with that as you're going through your message. But, but the main thing I want you to get here is be very careful. Let me just tell you, here's a, this isn't in my notes, but here's another little practical thing I would share with you. Be very careful with this, you know, even 
with your children. Some of you have children. Some of you will have children. I think it's very dangerous for parents to speak, to, to give uh, guidelines, rules to their children that are biblical rules with the same, and then give their own rules with the same authority. Because that's very confusing to children. For example, what, let's take, I have daughters. I have three teenage daughters. Uh, well, one's just no longer a teenager, just turned 20. But basically, three teenage daughters. What does the Bible say about their dress? It says they must be modest. M- what I've told them is, look, that what the Bible says is this. You will give an account for being modest with your dress before the Lord. Now, how we define that modesty is an issue of conscience. Different women, different cultures decide differently. You go to India, and uh, you know I've been there. I, I love going there and ministering there. And the women in the church are walking around with their midriff showing. But they would never dream of wearing pants, for example, or letting any part of their ankle show. You know, there, there are these cultural differences to modesty. And there are conscience decisions about modesty. So I tell my girls, look, the biblical command is you must be modest. How, you, how that plays out in your life is an issue of conscience. When you're in my home, under my authority, it's my conscience that makes that decision. <laughs> but there are some general principles. You know, there's, it shouldn't be too low, shouldn't be too high, shouldn't be too tight, shouldn't be transparent. You know, these are things I rehearse with my, with my daughters. But those are, you understand what I'm saying? I think it's helpful even with your kids and certainly with the people you're shepherding to differentiate between thus saith the Lord and thus saith dad or thus saith pastor because those are not the same. And you want them to leave your home respecting God and the scripture and having their consciences bound because if you tie them together, what happens? They leave home, and they come up with a different decision, and they jettison modesty. I don't want them to feel they can do that. Okay? So that's also true with with how you handle these issues in, in your church. This can still be helpful, though. Please don't hear me scaring you away from sharing means. For example, I'm talking about the the discipline of the spiritual disciplines. Just as our bodies have to have basic components. They have to have sleep, they have to have water, they have to have food, they have to have oxygen. If you have those, you can live. The same thing for our souls. There are essential elements that our souls must have to have any degree of health. Neglect them and your spiritual health will suffer just as if you neglect any one of those others, your physical health will suffer. And so if I'm telling people that, I'm telling my men that, and I'm saying you need to be in the word of God every day, that's a biblical thou shalt. But if I'm telling them, look, guys, if you put this off till 10 p.m. at night, more days than not, it's not going to happen. So get up early before your kids are interrupting you and get time in the word and in prayer. Now we're gone, we've gone to ways and means. And when I tell them that, I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to make it clear, this is thus saith the Lord. This is, here's some ideas for how to do that. And they're not inspired. Okay. The third part of this definition from Broadus is pointing out the motivation. Why? This is persuading them to a response in the sense of a moral and spiritual appeal for a right response. It usually does answer the question, why, along with that appeal. I think the classic biblical example of this kind of application, sort of persuading, pleading to an appeal is in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, I beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I plead with you. I beg you. He's persuading to a response, appealing for a moral and spiritual response to the truth. What are the sources for application? First of all, clear application in the text itself. We've already talked about this, but how does that manifest itself? Usually it manifests itself in one of two ways, either the imperative mood, the mood of command, or the hortatory, the the let us in the epistles. 
So understand application in the text itself. Secondly, use your own spiritual experiences with the, with the issue the text addresses. Remember your, your meditation. In that meditation process, you're not only trying to understand the text better, you're trying to apply the text to yourself. Well, guess what happens? You're not trying to prepare a sermon while you're meditating. You're thinking about the truth. You're applying it personally. But if it applies to you in that way, there's a really good chance it's going to be helpful for you to share that with your people as well as an application for them. As 1 Corinthians reminds us, there has no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So um, there is a, there's a great... If I struggle with certain things, then there's a very real chance that people in my congregation struggle with applying that truth in the same way I do. So that becomes, that doesn't mean I stand up and say, now I struggle with this in this way. I might, but I don't have to. I'm just saying that provides me with the, the sort of information to say, here is a legitimate application of this because it, it's how it applies to me. Thirdly, observation of the culture. For example, you're preaching through Romans 1, and there is a lot of overlap, as we've noted, between what goes on in Romans 1 and our culture. So there's a lot of application material that immediately becomes obvious just from having read the newspaper, having read you know, uh, a, a website, a news website. Number four, observation of your people. In other words... It's like we were talking about the other day, even as you're deciding a biblical book, you're thinking about the needs of your flock, the needs of your people. For example, I live in Dallas. What is Dallas mostly known for, besides the Cowboys? Guns. <laughs> Guns. No, I mean, it's really known, if, if you talk to people who travel to Dallas and that's, they come there, they come there for food and, and clothes, shopping. Ours is a very... Ours is a very upscale area. It's an area that's, that's wealthy, and there's a very real temptation to, to the lust of the eyes, to you've got to have this. You know, if you don't have this, you don't have this designer purse. If you don't have this, you know, house, if you don't have this car, then whatever. Well, knowing that that's a struggle that in, in the larger area in which I live, as I'm applying a text, I'm going to apply it that way. I'm going to remind them that, that a man's life doesn't consist of the things he possesses. That it's wrong to covet what you don't have. So the culture helps me, as I see the larger culture in which I minister and live, it helps frame up some of the application that I'm going to make. Now, a caution here. Never, ever preach at, at an individual in your church. I never craft any part of my sermon with a person in my church in mind. Unfortunately, that happens. Where pastors will sort of do their counseling from the pulpit. I know this guy struggles with this, so I'm going to hammer him. Never, ever do that. That's a breach of your, of your ministry, I think. If you need to talk to him, if there's a struggle in his life, go to him privately. But don't sort of use the pulpit as a sort of bully pulpit to, to attack him. What if you're... Yeah, of course. If it's a larger issue that, that people in your church struggle with, what I'm saying is when you're in your study, don't say, you know what? I know so-and-so. This is a problem for him. I'm going to put this, these couple lines in for him because he really needs to hear this. I don't think that's legitimate. I think you need to teach the scripture and you need to teach it to your people. If there is a problem with an individual that you feel you need to insert something in your sermon to address, go talk to him privately. Don't ever insert it in your sermon to sort of get him. The other source I would recommend for application, and I've mentioned this along the way, is some of the more pastoral devotional commentaries. Uh, I love, for, for good application ideas, I love Lloyd-Jones. Obviously, um, you know, he's one of the men that greatly influenced my own life and ministry. When I was in seminary, I read the, the Sermon on the Mount. If you haven't read Lloyd-Jones' Sermon on the Mount, put it on the top of your reading list. It'll change your life. But it, it hugely impacted me, and I really appreciate him and his ministry to this day. 
but I don't read his commentaries to do all the exegetical work we've talked about because that's not what he did. But as far as insight into the application of the text, he was profound and uh, often ministers to my soul, minister to yours, and through you, it'll minister to others. Boyce also uh, is very helpful that way. In Romans, occasionally I'll get a decent application idea from Barnhouse, uh, not, not quite as much as the others, and occasionally I'll get an illustration idea from Barnhouse. But, but particularly Lloyd-Jones, Boyce, those kind of guys, even John, uh, his commentary, you'll get some good application ideas or uh, illustration ideas from particularly um, application. All right, the dangers of application. What to be aware of? I've already mentioned a couple of those, but number one is making the timeless principles you derive from the text or your application have the same authority as God's explicit commands. Just be really careful here. Usually, what this is, is insisting that other people live by your conclusions or by your convictions, by what you have determined um, is helpful to keep that command. For example, let me, let me share one with you that I encounter with the people in my, some of the people in my church. We have in our youth group about a third, a third, and a third. A third homeschoolers, a, a third public, and a third private. That's pretty much the makeup of our youth group. And some of the homeschoolers will reason like this. And by the way, we homeschooled our kids, not out of this great conviction, but because I'm a pastor, I have Mondays off. If, we, if they went to school on Mondays, I'd never see my kids. So, so that's just a decision we made. But it's, you know, it's kid at a time, year at a time. It's not like a, this is God's way. But here's what happens in some cases. You have the biblical imperative in Deuteronomy 6, which is that parents are to teach their children the law of God, the word of God. An application of that or an implication of that would be better. That we as a family feel we can best do that through homeschooling. The problem is when then you say, therefore, every Christian parent should make the same decision. Now you've gone beyond the scripture. You have given your implication or application the same authority as God's explicit command. A second danger is failing to distinguish between cultural commands and timeless commands. For example, foot washing would be a great example of that. You probably have been in a church or at least known of a church where they practice foot washing. They have missed the the fact that that was a cultural issue teaching a timeless lesson and instead applied it uh, timelessly. Thirdly, artificially identifying timeless commands as culturally conditioned. Now, this is the other side of that. And I understand these are interpretive challenges, but I think you have to be careful. For example, uh, the command in 1 Timothy 2 that women are not to have authority over men in the context of the church. They're not to teach men. What do evangelical, quote-unquote, feminists do with that passage? They say, well, the, that was a culturally conditioned mandate. How do you argue against that? How would you tell an ev- evangelical feminist that she's wrong? The two reasons in the text. The two reasons are tied not to the culture, but to the beginning. So, in addition, they're in the pastoral epistles, specifically commanding how one is to conduct himself. Remember 1 Timothy 3.15? How one is to conduct himself in the household of God, the church. The purpose um, is clear there, both the order of creation, and the fall. Number four, here's another danger of application. Applying personal convictions rather than the authorial intent. This is related to what we've talked about, but let me give you an example in the sort of legalistic circles I grew up in. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, abstain from every form of evil. 
What did the King James say? Does anybody remember? Abstain from every appearance of evil. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a significant problem in the translation there in the King James. But the way that was explained to all of us as kids was, that means you shouldn't do anything if anybody thinks you might be doing something you shouldn't be doing. And so, never go to a movie theater because somebody might think you're going to see that other movie rather than the whatever. That's, that's a flawed... Um, a flawed approach to application. Number five, failing to apply the truth to your own life. And again, we've talked about that. Don't be the hypodermic needle that delivers the medicine and is unaffected by it. That's James 1.22. Don't be merely a hearer of the word or you're deluding yourself, maybe proving that you're not a believer at all. All right. So when you're looking to apply the text, ask these key questions. Number one, what did the author want the original readers to do in response to this passage? What did the author want the original readers to do in response to this passage? Number two, what am I supposed to do in response to this passage? Those are two different things. Okay, remember if, if the command is sort of tied back in time and in culture, he may have wanted them to do something, but the timeless principle is requiring something else of me. So two different questions. Number three, why am, why am I supposed to do what this passage teaches? Is there within this passage an explanation of the motivation? If there is, I also want to explain that to my congregation. Number four, What are some of the practical ways or means that I can think of to do what this passage teaches? You see how we're getting, with each step, we're getting a little farther away from authorial intent, and therefore you have to be more careful. But all of these are legitimate questions to ask, both in applying the text to yourself and in helping to apply it to your congregation. But remember, number one, is authoritative. That's God's intent. You get to number four, it's not authoritative at all. So you've got to be careful to differentiate uh, as, you, as you answer these questions for your people. As you apply the text in answer to these questions, you've got to differentiate between one and the other. Let me give you an example of these four questions worked out. Let's take, and, and I just picked one, okay, so hang with me. Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. Pretty straightforward, so you don't have to do a lot of work to sort of bring it over in, in, you know, from the biblical world to the, to the contemporary world. But let's talk about number one. What's question number one? What is, what is the author, what did the author intend his original audience to do in response to this? The original readers God expressly forbids his people to have a sexual relationship with someone who is not their spouse. There's your, there is your primary application. You're preaching this verse, that is what you hammer, because that is clearly the authorial intent application. Number another, um, so, so original readers and authorial intent for me are very similar. I may not enter into a sexual relationship with anyone who is not my spouse. Or if I'm preaching this, you may not enter into a sexual relationship with someone who isn't your spouse. So you have your original readers. Turns out, in this case, the authorial intent for me and you in today's world is almost identical. May not always be identical. Also, clearly, authorial intent for me today is I may not allow myself to desire a sexual relationship with someone who's not my spouse. Interpreted in context, you have thou shalt not covet, and down there it talks about not coveting your neighbor's wife. So in context, the, the authorial intent, I can speak authoritatively in applying this text, not only are you not to have a sexual relationship with anyone who isn't your spouse, you're not to allow yourself to desire a sexual relationship with someone who isn't your spouse. What about motivation? Why am I supposed to do this? Well, there's no explicit motivation given, although 
you could go back to the preface to the Ten Commandments, and there there is a motivation. So you could include that if you were preaching this text. But you're always looking in the, con- in the text and in the context, is there a motivation given? And if so, you want to give it to your people. What about ways and means? Well, if I'm, if I'm helping now my congregation with some ways and means to do this, let's say that, um, that you know, I, and, and I've done this. I've said to my congregation, you have to put hedges up. You know, you can't have the same style of relationship with members of the opposite sex you had before you were married. You have to treat them differently. So one of those ways is not allowing close relationships with members of the opposite sex who are not my spouse. Now, is, is that a biblical command? No, that's a way or a means to accomplish the biblical command. But it is a legitimate way but it's not as authoritative as the first two. Another way or means to accomplish this is not being alone in potentially intimate situations with members of the opposite sex. I tell my staff, you never in your office without the window open or or somebody else in the office with a member of the opposite sex. You never drive anywhere in a car with a member of the opposite sex unless there are other people present. You never have a meal with a member of the opposite sex. Why? Because the Bible commands that? No, because it would be stupid to do otherwise. And because it is a legitimate way and means to protect yourself from the temptations that can come. And not just the temptations, but, you know, there are nutty people out there who will make accusations even if it's not a problem for you. That's happened. I've seen that happen where a man's ministry has been destroyed when he wasn't involved, but, but a woman who was, you know, making, um, using his, his failure to set these hedges and making accusations that weren't true and destroy, destroying him in the process. All right, so let's look at Romans 1. Let me just show you kind of how this might unfold. I'm going to pull up this, this last paragraph of Romans 1, my notes there, and let me show you a couple of ways that I did the application. All right, so I was talking about sexual sin, God abandoning them to sexual sin. Uh, the reason, here we go, application. This is, in this case, and there was application woven throughout the message, but here's kind of my, my concluding application. Application for Christians. First of all, sexual sin is morally wrong and a violation of God's clear commands. That's clear in the text. I'm making, this is, this is original readers to some extent, but certain author, uh, authorial intent. This grows out of what I am legitimately supposed to do with this text. Secondly, sexual sin shames, degrades, and dishonors you in your body. Again, that's authorial intent right out of the text. You must not tolerate sexual lust or sexual sin. Ephesians 5, 3, they must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Uh, The NIV captures Paul's meaning here, but among you there must not be even a hint of these sins. This is God's standard of sexual purity. And then I took them to 1 Thessalonians 4 and walked through verses 1 through 8 there about God desires your sanctification, even that you possess your vessel in sanctification and honor and just walk through it there. And then I said, this was part of my application in terms of ways and means. If you struggle with sexual sin, Listen to the series I did on Ephesians 5, where I dealt with this at length. And so that was a, that was a practical way or means. If there are people in my church who weren't there when I did that, they're really struggling with this issue, they can get some practical help in going more in depth than I did in this message. Uh, a fourth application for believers was praise God for the gospel through which he has rescued us from the guilt of sexual lust and sin and from the controlling power of lust and sin. Now, why, is that a legitimate, is that a sort of authorial intent application, or did I just come up with that on my own? Now, in context, that's clearly an authorial intent, because we're talking about where it is in Romans. It's leading to the gospel. It's saying, here's man's utter lack of righteousness, and why he needs the gospel. So this is related, again, back to the, the larger context of the book itself. Application for unbelievers. 
Here is another reason you need the gospel. Every time you have given in to sexual craving, every time you have coddled it, every time you have given in to those desires and acted upon them, you have broken God's law and accumulated more personal guilt in God's sight. Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Don't think that because God doesn't strike you down for your sexual sin and lust, he is indifferent. Paul tells us that if your sexual lust or sexual sin is growing in frequency, intensity, and seriousness, Here in this passage, that means that in and of itself is evidence of God's anger against your sin. You are experiencing God's wrath of abandonment. But the good news is that that doesn't have to be permanent. If you'll turn from your sin to God and you will confess his son Jesus as your Savior and Lord, God will forgive your sin because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I fill that out just a little bit more as I was preaching through it. So do you see now, I mean, here in this text, there is legitimate, it's talking about God abandoning pagans to their sexual sin. In this text, there is legitimate application that plays on authorial intent, both for believers and for unbelievers. Uh, Do I, um, yes, I do that, but only if the text itself is, is differently applied. I mean, clearly in a gospel text like this one, sexual sin um, and um, the gospel, the need for the gospel, this universally applies. You know, so that's why I did here. You'll notice I intentionally broke sexual craving and coddling it from acting out on it because I'm hitting a lot of different people there. You know, those, those, those guys who struggle with internet pornography, the, the youth who are just beginning to give in to, you know, some of those cravings that come with puberty and, and you know, their hormones. You've got, you've got people, then I go to people acting out on it. Basically, that's usually going to be you know, past puberty and, and adults and beyond. And so I, I feel like in the way I've written this, that I've done just that. But I don't intentionally, when I'm going through a passage talking about lust and sexual sin, I'm not going to say, okay, let's talk about how you mothers struggle with this. Or, but I might. When I taught through Ephesians 5, I felt it was legitimate to say every human being struggles with desiring, uh, being tempted to desire a relationship beyond that of their spouse. What does that look like for, for men? And I briefly went through that. Then what does that look like for women? It's usually different, okay? It's not usually, it, it, more and more because of our, our picture-based culture, image-based culture, pornography is becoming an increasing problem for women. But the, the relational issue is, is usually where that comes from. They attach relationally or they read some romantic novel and, you know, and fantasize about you know, having that person as their spouse rather than their uncaring, you know, unfeeling spouse. So, so it does look different. And, and so I might do that, but I don't always do that. It depends on, if, if I were preaching through, Ephes- I, when I was preaching through Ephesians 5, I did that because that whole paragraph is about sexual sin. And so I wanted to deal with the nuances of it. Here, this is part of a larger paragraph about God's abandoning pagans. And one of the ways he does that is to, sex, to increasing sexual sin. I often do because most of the people in my church are believers. And I am called upon primarily to edify the saints. Yes, I do evangelize. I do. I mean, you, you see, I, I bring the gospel to bear often in my messages. Rarely does a week go by when I don't bring the gospel to bear in some way. But in the same way, I want to recognize that at least half, I hope closer to 80% of the people out there listening to me are in Christ. So I want them to think this passage can legitimately be applied to us too. In what ways? How, if you're reading this passage as a believer, how do you respond to this, this evangelistic passage? And I, that's, in more ways than the that's right. Yeah, you just have to acknowledge that. But you're still within the scope of the Scripture. You're not in ways and means where you're inventing something. I mean, other passages command us to praise God for the gospel. So 
You see what I'm saying? So there's a sort of sliding scale away from authorial intent. And that one's a better place to be, a, a, a safer place, maybe a better way to say, than when you get to ways and means where you're talking about things the Bible doesn't specifically address. teaching in the Old Testament, how often, or in some passage that is used in the New, how often do you use that for your application, or do you leave that more for what the specific author is talking about in that book, like the Exodus one, did you bring about like what Jesus talked about with uh, putting adultery, or do you just leave that there and discuss only what's happening in Exodus? No, I, I, again, it's back to the analogy of Scripture, not only does Scripture help me understand Scripture, but Scripture fills out and enriches my understanding. If the New Testament is, is speaking to that, if I'm preaching through the Old Testament and the New Testament speaks to that, I want to let the New Testament speak to that. We're legitimate. And so I want to bring that in. I want to show them those relationships. I want them to see that we have this cohesive, this cohesive revelation of God given by the one mind of the Spirit and that this fits with this. And, and here's Jesus speaking to that very issue. Now, how much time I spend a particular place, that's sort of a judgment call. I may simply refer to it. I may quote it and move on. I may have them turn there and take time explaining it. You know, that's just a judgment call depending on the text and how much it figures into the understanding of the text. Would, they, would you teach that as if they knew that it would extend to the heart too? I would say they should have known that. Because as I said the other day, we were talking about interpreting the Ten Commandments. You have, you have two positive, eight negative. That tells you a lot about what, why Jesus could eventually make all of them positive. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbors yourself. You have, you have nine that on the surface appear to be external actions and one that is clearly only internal. That tells you that there's likely a legitimate apl internal application to all of those commands. So I, I think, yes, I think they should have known. Did they always know? No, probably not. I think that's why you have the Pharisees externalizing it. And that's why you have Paul saying, you know, when I finally came to understand Romans 7, thou shalt not covet, I was devastated. It, it, you know, it killed me. Again, here's one where at the end, I do pretty much the same thing I did in the last one. Let's, uh, this, is, um, this is the one excuse me, on homosexuality, a God abandoning people to homosexuality. Let's apply this text, what this text teaches to ourselves. Number one, our pagan society will become increasingly accepting of homosexuality. Don't be surprised. You know, you have to believe what God has said in his word and not what the culture and, and expect to be persecuted for holding the biblical position. That is a, that is a, again, Related to authorial intent, a culture is going that is increasingly becoming pagan is going to become more accepting of this. Therefore, we can expect this response. Christians must never tolerate or act on homosexual temptations. If as a Christian you're tempted to be attracted sexually to members of the same sex, you must respond to that temptation the same way all Christians must respond to their temptations and lusts. Colossians 3, 5, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. Put them to death. Don't allow them. Don't tolerate them. Don't coddle them in your mind. Don't allow them. Number three, those who excuse homosexual lust and act on that lust are not Christians. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Here you have the effeminate, that's the passive partner in a homosexual relationship, nor homosexuals, that's the active partner in a homosexual relationship, will inherit the kingdom of God. One whose life is characterized by homosexuality is unrighteous. Doesn't belong to Jesus' spiritual kingdom. In other words, he's not a Christian. Unless he repents, he will not inherit a place in Jesus' future kingdom. Instead, he will be sentenced to eternal hell. Number four, God can rescue and change homosexuals. 1 Corinthians six eleven. such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. There were Christians in Corinth 
who used to be homosexuals, but whom God had changed. They were living lives of sexual purity, either in celibacy or in a heterosexual marriage. And then I I made this. There's an important point here for us who are in Christ. Homosexuals are not our enemies. They're our mission field. And if you're not a Christian and you're enslaved to homosexuality, God can change you. Homosexuality is a sin, but it's a sin like all others that can be forgiven by God's grace because of Jesus' death in the place of sinners on the cross. And the gospel not only promises you God's forgiveness, but his power to overcome your sin, including the sin of homosexuality. Okay? So you see what I'm talking about here. You're you're looking at how does this text flesh out in the lives of the people in front of me. Believers, unbelievers, my own life, etc. One more example. We'll go to, um, let me find it here. And again, I, I pulled this one document because it's a lot easier to find. But um, this is when I was teaching through the depraved mind there, the list of 21 sins. I said that list of, of 21 sins is merely a sample of the relationally destructive sins that result from a depraved mind, the depraved mind to which God abandons unbelieving pagans. Um, unbelievers who are filled with these kinds of sins, or it is unbelievers who are filled with these kinds of sins, This is a warning in our Christianized culture. If you claim to be a Christian, but your life is consistently marked by these and other works of the flesh, it is likely you are not a Christian at all. Took them to Galatians 5. Now the deeds of the flesh, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. As believers, we must not allow these sins to reign in us, Romans 6. And the fact that we have all been guilty of these and many other sins is the reason we all need the gospel. Verse 32, those who commit these things are worthy of death. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed. If you're not a Christian, if you're not yet a Christian, you saw yourself in several, if not all, of these sins. You are guilty before God. Not only do you see your sin, but God does. Not only do you see your sin, but God does. Your only hope is the gospel. If you're already a Christian, don't forget that every one of us has been guilty of all these sins many times. You might argue with the exception of murder, but our Lord said that if you've been angry enough with someone to lash out with angry words, you're guilty enough to go to hell for murder in your heart. So even if you were not a pagan before Christ, even if you were religious, you were still filled with these sins and you were on your way to judgment. This passage should drive us who are in Christ to our knees in gratitude for the gospel and for the grace of God shown us in Christ. So, Those are three illustrations just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. 